turn to two places in our Bibles tonight. Uh, Psalm 82. Uh, go ahead and mark Deuteronomy chapter 32 as well. If you're tired tonight, I'll be in prayer for you. Uh, we have a lot that we're going to cover tonight. Um, we're looking at two related things. We're looking at the idea of the divine council and having a Deuteronomy 32 worldview. That'll start to make more sense as we go through our study. Um, the stage has been set uh, really in our most immediate uh, previous two Sunday mornings. So we looked at Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations, and then this past Sunday, the Tower of Babel from Genesis chapter 11. Um, as I always like to tell people, if you have not been studying with us, make sure you go back and study through those things on your own time so you can kind of start to connect the dots because what we're not going to do tonight, we just don't have time, we're not going to reestablish any of the things that we've already talked about um, and I want to begin by offering some disclaimers tonight, okay? So I've already alluded to this. Uh, tonight is not going to be a devotion, okay? This is not Bible study light. So if that's what you came looking for, you are in the wrong place. Um, this is also not going to be dialogue style teaching. That's what we normally do on Wednesday night. This is lecture style teaching. So if you have questions, comments, arguments, whatever it might be, hold those till afterwards. You can come find me. I'll stay here as long as you want tonight talking about whatever it is you want to talk about. But honestly, that's done in the interest of everybody's time. Um, also, I, I'm going to say this, that, that what we're talking about tonight, I can't necessarily stand before you and say, thus saith the Lord. Um, I think there's merit. I think there's truth to it. If I didn't, I wouldn't waste your time or mine. Uh, but it's kind of like the rapture of the church. You know, I hold a particular view. Uh, I will cite passages and tell you why I believe in a pre-tribulational view of the rapture of the church. I recognize there's people who see it differently than me. I don't think it's worth dividing over. Uh, tonight's a little bit like that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, I used to say this to my Bible college students. I know this is going to sound rude to the wrong ear, but it's on you to listen, Okay. Uh, and the reason I say that is because invariably somebody will come up to me and say, you know when you said, and I'm always amazed at the things people will tell me that I said. And I'm like, stop, go back and listen to the study. I never said that. Um, so it's just, I, I just want to encourage you guys to, to pay attention. So uh, let's pray one more time and then we're going to start by establishing some parameters to what we're going to talk about tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for an opportunity to assemble together as your people, uh, to sit at your feet and hear your word. And thank you that you're here. Uh, thank you that you have not left us orphans, but you have made us your sons and your daughters, and that you're reconciling the nations back into a relationship with you. We pray that you'd be glorified here tonight, that you would use your word to instruct and guide your people by the power of your Holy Spirit and to the glory of your everlasting name. And we pray these things in your name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Okay, uh, let's again establish some parameters. Uh, this might rattle somebody's cage right off the bat. Uh, but this is not the name of our God. Okay, this is a word that denotes certain things in our mind. Uh, a guy you'll hear me quote from tonight a lot, Dr. Michael Heiser. He's an Old Testament scholar, uh, very well versed in the Hebrew language and Near Eastern languages, says, when we see the word G-O-D, we instinctively think of a divine being with a unique set of attributes, omnipresence, omnipotence, sovereignty, but this is not how a biblical writer thought about the term. Biblical authors did not assign a specific set of attributes to the word Elohim. That's the word in Hebrew. So a lot of times what we do is we conflate this word with this word, okay? This is the personal name of our God, and there is none like our God, amen? Isaiah 49, verse 6, Yahweh says, there is none like me. Okay, so a term I like to use when talking about this is we'll say that Yahweh is species unique. There is none like him. He is completely holy, completely set apart. He alone is omniscient. He alone is omnipresent. He alone is omnipotent. He has no beginning, no end, right? From eternity out of mind, he's not a created being. In fact, we could say that in, in everything that exists, there's two categories. There's Yahweh, right? He alone is holy. He's set apart. And then there's everything else that exists, which by the way, 
Yahweh created. But the actual term, God, Elohim, that is not his name. And so this becomes important, okay, because in just a few moments, somebody is going to think that what I'm saying is this, that Yahweh is one God amongst a pantheon of other gods. And I can assure you that is not what I'm saying. What I am going to say is this, that our God, Yahweh, who is alone, species unique, he rules over a bunch of other created beings that the Bible also refers to as Elohim. Okay, sometimes they're called angels, sometimes they're called demons, sometimes principalities, powers, rulers, dominions. Dr. Michael Heiser writes, the Bible refers to a half dozen different entities with the word Elohim. By any account, the attributes of those entities are not equal to Yahweh. So for instance, in Judges chapter 11, verse 24, the false god Chemosh is referred to as an Elohim. In 1 Kings 11.33, the word Elohim describes Ashtoreth and Milcom. In Deuteronomy 32, this word Elohim refers to demons. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, when Saul visits the witch of Endor, and he says, call up Samuel for me, and she says, I see a God coming out of the fire. The word that is used there is Elohim. Paul even refers to Satan as the God of this age. The word God in this verse, it's in the Greek, it's theos, but it's the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew term Elohim. Now, is Paul, or are any of these passages, saying that Satan or any of these false gods somehow equal to Yahweh? Of course not. However, the same word is used to describe the type of being that Yahweh is that's used to describe the type of being that these other created beings are. The Old Testament writers understood that Yahweh was an Elohim, but no other Elohim was Yahweh. That's important. New Testament, Old Testament writers understood that Yahweh was an Elohim, but no other Elohim was Yahweh. Now, another thing we need to establish is that Yahweh needs absolutely nothing, right? He's totally self-sufficient. In Acts 17, Paul speaks of God who made the world and everything in it, who does not dwell in temples made with hands as though he needed anything. However, God loves to share authority. Okay, we see this all the way back at the beginning with Adam. First chapter of the Bible, God says, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. Right off the bat, God is sharing authority. He doesn't have to, but he does to the apostles. Jesus gives power and authority over all the demons. He says, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. In Matthew 19, he says, in the regeneration, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is God sharing authority with the church. Now, if you're a New Testament Christian, I'm sure you already know this, but in the millennium, God's going to share authority with us. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure, we shall reign with him. In Revelation 5.10, the saints say, we shall reign on the earth. Revelation 26 says, the one who has part in the first resurrection will reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 22.5, they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 3.21, Jesus says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit on my throne. In fact, did you know that as Christians, we are sometimes referred to in the New Testament as sons of God? Romans 8.14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Galatians 3.26 says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.19 says, The earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing 
of the sons of God. That's us. That's not referring to Old Testament angels. They've already been revealed, but you and I have not yet been revealed in all of our resurrection glory. In Luke 20, 35, Jesus says, those who are counted worthy to attain the resurrection are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection, okay? So we are told that we're gonna reign and rule with Christ. We're gonna sit on thrones. We're gonna be equal to the sons of God. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, we're gonna judge angels. So this is our God, Yahweh, species unique, doesn't need anything, totally self-sufficient, but choosing to share authority with you and I. Now, my question will become, if we can accept that, why will we have such a hard time believing that God is doing the exact same thing right now with angels? And so this is where we come to the idea of the divine counsel. So you should be in Psalm 82. Uh, let's read a couple of verses tonight. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version of the Bible, and then we'll talk a little bit more about why in just a few moments. Uh, verse 1, the psalmist writes, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Now, the New King James Version says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty he judges among the gods. And then off to the side, there's a footnote which reads, Hebrew Elohim, mighty ones, that is, the judges. Okay, so what the translators are saying in this version is that the gods in this passage are actually the judges of Israel or human leaders like Samuel, Gideon. Samson. Now, I struggle with that interpretation. Douglas Stewart in the New American Commentary of Exodus says the idea that Elohim could mean judges or human leaders at even a single place in the Old Testament has always been conjectural and unconvincing. The term has always referred to an entity from the spiritual realm. So I think instead what we see in this passage is our God, Yahweh, species unique, presiding over a council, a congregation of other lesser beings, but who are also referred to as Elohim. So what you have in this passage is God, Elohim, has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the Elohim. He holds judgment. That's the literal translation of that verse. See, the word Elohim can either be singular or it can be plural. People like to say, well, that's really confusing. Why would they do something like that? Well, we have words that do the exact same thing. The word sheep, for instance. When I use the word sheep, do I mean a single sheep or do I mean a group of sheep? You don't know unless we look at the language that's around it. If I say the sheep is in the road, you know that I mean a single sheep. But if I say the sheep are in the road, you know that I mean more than one sheep. Okay, so in this verse, we know that the first Elohim is singular because it says he holds judgment. It's a singular male pronoun that refers back to the first Elohim. We know the second Elohim is plural because they're called a council in the first half of the verse. So think of it this way. We might say God with a capital G versus God with a little g. Elohim with a capital E versus Elohim with a little e. So when you're reading your Bible, you'll come across terms like this, most high. But then you'll also see phrases like this, the heavenly host or the host of heaven. It's talking about this very thing. One article writes, the word host refers to a great number or individual of individuals or an army. Modified by the word heavenly, hosts becomes a great number of angelic beings forming a celestial army under God's command. One of God's titles is Lord of hosts. 
In Hebrew, it is Yahweh Sabaoth, which means Lord of the heavenly armies. Psalm 148 and 103 equate the terms angels with heavenly hosts. So again, Yahweh, species unique, totally self-sufficient, most high, presiding over a council, a congregation of lesser created spiritual beings, but who are also referred to as Elohim. Psalm 89 says, Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A great God, sorry, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. That's Yahweh and his council. That's the Most High and the heavenly host. So the question becomes, do we see this idea of a divine council throughout the Old Testament. So let's start with a couple of obvious ones, right? Job chapters 1 and 2. They tell us that a day came when the sons of God, we're not going to go into how we know sons of God are angels. That's quite clear whenever we look into the text. When the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. And God says to Satan, I'm paraphrasing, he says, where did you come from? Satan says, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And this is where they enter into, we'll call it a wager, right? He says, there's none like him in all the earth, right? And Satan says, well, you know what? Of course he loves you. It's because you've blessed him. But if you let me take away everything he has, if you let me attack his physical body, he'll curse you. God says, go for it. Okay, this seems to talk about a specific day when the sons of God, angelic beings, came and are having a conversation with the Most High about the affairs of men. Here's an even more specific one. 1 Kings chapter 22. Now, this is where the Lord has determined that it's time for Ahab to die, right? And the prophet Micaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven, standing by. And the Lord asks, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he might fall at Ramoth Gilead? Now keep in mind the parameters we've already established. Yahweh is species unique. He does not need anything. And yet here is this self-sufficient God actually choosing to share authority with a council and seek their input. Now, don't think seek input the way you or I seek input. When you and I seek input, we might actually allow somebody to weigh in on our decision making. I do not think that is what the Lord is doing here. To me, this reminds me a little bit like John chapter six, the feeding of the 5,000, when Jesus lifts his eyes and he sees the big crowd and he turns to Philip and he says, where are we gonna buy bread that these may eat? But in the very next line, it says, this he said to test him, because he himself knew what he would do. Okay, so the divine counsel, I believe, is a lot like that. But check it, check this out. God says, hey, who's going to persuade Ahab to go up that he might fall at Ramoth Gilead? Okay, so one spoke in this manner. Now, this is the host of heaven. One spoke in this manner. Another spoke in that manner, and then a spirit came forward and stood by before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. God says, in what way? So the spirit said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and prevail. Go and do so. Therefore, look, Micaiah says, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. It's in our Bibles. Now, who has the input here? This divine council, this heavenly host. But who makes the decision? Who does it? It's God. Okay, some people see the idea of a divine council in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, and above it stood seraphim, one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But when the Lord asks, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Some people see in that question the idea of God 
inviting input from a divine counsel. Speaking of Isaiah, chapter 14, when we read of Lucifer's fall, Isaiah writes, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, interestingly, the word stars here can be translated brothers. Job 38 also equates the term sons of God with stars. So this could read, I will exalt my throne above my brothers, and I will also sit on the mount of the assembly. Who's the assembly? Some people see the divine counsel in that language. In Daniel chapter 4, judgment has been pronounced against Nebuchadnezzar. This is when he's going to become like an animal and eat grass like the oxen. He's told this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. And Daniel calls this watcher a holy one coming down from heaven. Now, location is important because Daniel is the only book of the Bible where holy ones are referred to as watchers. But where is Daniel writing from? Daniel is in Babylon, which is ancient Mesopotamia. So large sections of the book of Daniel are not written in the Hebrew language. They're written in Aramaic. And we know from Mesopotamian archaeology that the Aramaic word ur, or watchers, refers to angels. So again, some people see the idea of a divine council here, right? The most high rules in the kingdom of men, but this is by the decision or the decree of the watchers. Some see the divine council in Daniel chapter seven and the vision of the ancient of days where thrones are put in place and the ancient of days is seated. Daniel says the court was seated and books were opened. Some say the court is the divine council. The reality is when you start noticing this, you'll start to see it quite a bit. Now, here's the question that people ask. They say, why does God need a council? Okay, well, think of it this way. This author puts it really well. God doesn't need a council, but it is scripturally clear that he has one. The question is similar to another. What does God need with people? The answer is the same. God does not need people. God does not depend on humans for his plans. God does not need us for evangelism. He could save all the people he wanted just by thinking about it. He could terminate evil in the blink of an eye, but instead he works his plan for all things on earth by using human beings. Now again, the weird thing is that most Christians have no trouble believing that we're going to reign and rule with Christ, right? He's going to share authority with us. We're going to sit upon thrones. We're going to be like sons of God, ruling over the nations. We'll believe that, but we're hesitant to believe this about the sons of God in the Old Testament. So let's come back to where we started in the beginning, Psalm 82. Uh, let's look at a couple of things. Uh, verse 1, again, God, capital G, Elohim has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods, little g. He holds judgment. So let's look at what he's saying to these lesser supernatural beings. He says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So he's rebuking them. He says, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So in other words, this is what they should have been doing, but they're not. And so God, capital G, Elohim, capital E, the Most High, is calling them on it. He says, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Verse six is important. Yahweh says, I said, you are God's. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince, or you will fall like one man, O princes. That's probably a closer way to read that. This is honestly 
probably one of the most misunderstood and misinterpreted passages of the Bible. And it's mainly because Jesus quotes from this passage in John chapter 10. And people misinterpret what Jesus is saying there. So let's remind ourselves of the occasion. Jesus has just made the claim that I and the Father are one. Okay? And the Jews clearly knew what he was talking about because we're told they pick up stones to kill him. And Jesus says in his defense, is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? He's quoting from Psalm 82, verse 6. Now, here's what people claim. People claim that what Jesus is saying is that he has a right to claim that he's God because in Psalm 82, God said to mortal men or human leaders that they were gods. But that completely defeats what Jesus is trying to say. Let me let Dr. Michael Heiser comment on this. He says, how is the mortal view of Psalm 82 a coherent defense of John's Christology by having Jesus use Psalm 82, 6 to say that he can call himself the son of God when every other Jew can? The mortal view does nothing to advance John's goal of portraying Jesus as the unique son of God. How does the mortal view explain the reaction of the Jewish audience? If Jesus citing a text that all of them could, why would Jesus' use of it elicit such a response? Jesus is making the point that there are other non-human sons of God, angels, Elohim, by referencing Psalm 82, Jesus is tweaking his opponents by claiming to be more than human, that he is divine and distinct from other divine sons of God. Now, the question always comes up, well, what about the description of Jesus being the only begotten son of God? Okay, the term only begotten is a somewhat unfortunate translation. It does not mean begotten in a birthing sense. It's a combination of two Greek words. It's the Greek word monogenes, okay? For years, this was thought to be a combination of the Greek word monos and the verb geneo, which means to beget or bear. But scholars later discovered that the second part of the word does not come from the verb geneo. It comes from the noun genus, which means class or kind. So the, the term literally means one of a kind or unique. Again, Dr. Michael Heiser writes, the validity of this understanding is borne out by the New Testament itself. Hebrews 11.17 calls Isaac Abraham's monogenous. But Isaac was not the only begotten son of Abraham in a created sense. Abraham had fathered Ishmael earlier. The term must mean that Isaac was Abraham's unique son, for he was the son of the promise. Just as Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim are Yahweh, Jesus is the unique son, but no other sons of God are like him. Now, my point is, when people misinterpret Jesus' use of Psalm 82, it confuses the interpretation of the original context. In Psalm 82, Yahweh, who's presiding over a council of lesser Elohim, tells them that they've failed at their mission and now they're going to be judged. He says they're going to die like men and fall like all the other princes. Okay, when did this judgment take place, right? It starts at Babel. And this is where we kind of move into part two of tonight. So let's look now at Deuteronomy chapter 32. This past Sunday, we talked about what happened at Babel. And to quickly summarize, it seems that in the same way the sons of God involved themselves in the affairs of men in Genesis chapter six, in an attempt to pollute the human gene pool, that something similar happened at Babel but this time, the sons of God attempt to corrupt man's worship of Yahweh. 
And Babel becomes the birthplace of all kinds of weird, demonic rituals and practices. It's often referred to as the mystery religion of Babylon. It's a blend of idolatry, sexual practices, drug use, mother goddess worship, astrology, and more. And its influence has never really left the earth. This is why in the last days there's going to be an end times revival of this false religious system. It's pictured by John in Revelation chapter 17 as a woman seated upon many waters who has influence over the whole world. And John says on her forehead, a name is written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother or the originator of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And what's going on at Babel is so bad that God comes down and once again judges the peoples and he confuses their languages and he scatters them abroad over the face of the earth. But in Deuteronomy chapter 32, when Moses is recounting Israel's history for them, he says something interesting in verse 7, Deuteronomy 32, 7, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version, and again, I'll explain why in just a moment. Deuteronomy 32, 7, Moses says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father, and he will show you your elders, and they will tell you. Verse 8, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, again, Babel, he fixed the borders or territories of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Okay, now if you're reading from the New King James or the King James or the NIV, the New American Standard, they will finish verse 8 by saying, God set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. Okay, but at least the NIV is good at including the footnote, Masoretic text, Dead Sea Scrolls, also Septuagint, say, sons of God. The New Living Translation, which I doubt anybody's using tonight, but it says, God established the boundaries of the people according to the number in his heavenly court. The Net Bible says, when he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the heavenly assembly. And the footnote here is very good. It says, sons of God is undoubtedly the original reading the Masoretic text and later versions of the Septuagint have each interpreted it differently. Masoretic text assumes the expression sons of God refers to Israel, while the Septuagint assumes the phrase refers to angelic being. The phrase is also attested in Ugaritic, which refers to high God El's divine assembly. According to the latter view, the Lord delegated jurisdiction over the nations to his angelic host while reserving for himself Israel over whom he rules directly. Okay, so this is what's called a textual variant, meaning not all the ancient manuscripts are the same. And so what we have to do here is a little bit of what's called textual criticism. And that's where you compare all of the ancient manuscripts to make the most informed decision about what's being said. So there's a quick video here that I want to show you on how textual criticism works. The second guy's accent's a little bit hard to listen to, but he reads the Bible in many different languages. So hang with him. It's really good content. Check this out. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the... The Young's literal translation reads, Sons of Israel. The Revised Standard Version reads, Sons of God. And the New Living Translation reads, Angelic Beings. Young's literal translation is taking its translation from the Hebrew in the Aleppo Codex, which reads, B'nai Yisrael, meaning Sons of Israel. The Revised Standard Version is taking its translation from the Hebrew in a Dead Sea Scroll that reads, B'nai Elohim, meaning sons of God. The New Living Translation is taking its translation from the Greek Septuagint, which reads Angelon Theu, meaning angel or messenger of God. The Aleppo Codex and the Dead Sea Scroll 
are two Hebrew versions coming from two different Hebrew sources, which we will call Hebrew number one and Hebrew number two. Hebrew number one reads B'nai Yisrael, meaning sons of Israel, while Hebrew number two reads B'nai Elohim, meaning sons of God. The Septuagint is a translation from an earlier Hebrew source, which we will call Hebrew number three, that reads B'nai El, also meaning sons of God, but a more primitive spelling that is commonly used among Semitic peoples for angels or messengers of God. The process of textual criticism compares these various readings to make a determination of which reading is the original. The consensus among scholars is that the original reading is B'nai El, sons of God. Notice that the letters in these two Hebrew words can be found within all three Hebrew versions. To understand the story and possible reasons for these two readings, we should dig into the oldest texts we have. So let's do that now. And let's start with Septuagint. Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew text created roughly in 3rd century BC. And most manuscripts of Septuagint have Angelon Teu, that is, angels of God. Obviously, none of the original manuscripts of Septuagint were preserved, so we are just working with transcriptions, just like in case of the original Hebrew text. And some of the more recent revisions of Septuagint have sons of Israel. Let's also have a look at the Masoretic texts. These texts are much later. They contain our Old Testament and they are considered by Jews to be the normative versions of the Hebrew scripture. Masoretic texts were created sometimes between 7th and 10th century AD, but they come from, from much older uh, manuscripts. Pretty much all of them read B'nai Israel, that is, sons of Israel. Then there is Vulgate. Vulgate is the oldest extant Latin translation of the Hebrew text. It was done by Jerome in 4th century AD. It reads, Filiorum Israel, that is, sons of Israel. Given this evidence, it is no wonder that pretty much all the old English translations, such as King James Version, have sons of Israel. But then archaeologists, almost by accident, made the discovery of the century, at least for biblical scholars. They found the Qumran, or sometimes also called Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls were written by the community of Qumran near Dead Sea, likely during 1st century BC. So they are much older than the Masoretic texts. And in the caves where this community preserved their treasured scrolls, two fragmentary scrolls of Deuteronomy were found. First one is called For QDTJ, and it is it says B'nai Elohim, that is sons of God. The second fragment is labeled For QDTQ, and it says B'nai El, sons of God. So if we summarize our findings, things look as follows: All the oldest Hebrew manuscripts have sons of God. All the oldest Septuagint manuscripts have sons of God. Some of the more recent Septuagint manuscripts have sons of Israel. The significantly later Vulgate has sons of Israel. And the much later Masoretic text has sons of Israel. And this is the reason why quite a few modern translations started to include the sons of God into their main text and are now putting sons of Israel into the notes. And those that did not do that yet at least have sons of God in the notes. So that's how we reconcile what's called a textual variant. Uh, and we arrive at the reading of sons of God in Deuteronomy 32.8. And I would say even if we just read the text, sons of Israel, that contextually, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So this is what we would call internal evidence, okay? You have external evidence, which is where you compare different manuscripts. But then internal evidence, if we were to read this, remember the days of old when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. Okay, so when did that happen? When were the national boundaries of nations around the world ever established according to the number of the children of Israel. 
In fact, if we read into the very next verse, it says, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance, which seems redundant to say God divides the nations according to the sons of Israel, but the Lord's portion is Israel. Jacob, what does that mean? But to read it this way, remember the days of old when the Most High divided mankind and he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So it seems like what you have is at Babel, the Lord essentially disinherits the nations, right? I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says, you know what? You guys don't want me, uh, so I'm going to hand you over to these these other Elohim, these lesser created beings, these rebellious Elohim, you guys can have them, but I'm going to take one people group. My portion is Jacob, and through them, I'm going to begin to work my promises, and I'm going to prove my work to the nations and to the rebellious gods that I am giving territoriality to over those nations. So in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses warns the people, he says, beware lest you raise your eyes to the heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. And so in Egyptology, you have a sun god, Ra, People today in Islam, they worship the moon god. Star worship is still very prevalent in the world today. Astrology. So this is not God saying, don't worship nature. These are symbols which represent or correspond to the rebellious Elohim, the sons of God, the host of heaven, who were not doing their job, and to whom the Lord gives rulership over the nations at Babel. Okay, so this is where you get the idea of territorial spirits. So in Daniel chapter 10, most of us are at least familiar with this passage or have heard it referenced before. Here's a quick synopsis. Daniel has been praying for three weeks and an angel shows up. Okay, we know it's an angel from clearly looking at the passage. And he says, I was sent to help you because from the first day you set your heart to understand your words were heard and I have come because of your words. But, he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. No scholar or commentator that I have ever come across believes this is a reference to a human leader. The prince of the kingdom of Persia refers to another angelic being who has territoriality over the geographic region of Persia, especially when the angel says, Michael, one of the chief princes, had to come and help me because I was left alone with the kings of Persia. I have a hard time believing that Michael the archangel would have to be dispatched to help an angel fight against a human being. And he says, now... I have to return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I have gone forth, the prince of Greece will come. Some people see in Ezekiel 38 the reference to the prince of Rosh as being a territorial spirit. In Daniel chapter 12, Michael is referred to as the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Who is Daniel's people? That would be the Israelites. So it seems that even Michael has a certain geographic region. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Good news is, of course, Jesus is the prince of princes. He's over all of them. But my point is that this is all language that's used to describe spiritual entities who have some kind of influence over or rulership over, territoriality over different geographic regions where they have sway and influence. We read about how the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Now, again, most people have probably heard this idea before of territorial spirits, 
But what we don't do is ask, well, when did that happen? When were they given territoriality over different places? This all happened at Babel. This is where Paul gets the idea of principalities. A prince would be the supernatural being. The principality would be the geographic region over which that prince has influence. Same thing with dominions. When Adam is given dominion over the earth, he is given rulership over the earth. When the New Testament talks about Jesus being seated far above all principality and power and might and dominion, that's what this is talking about. When the New Testament talks about the rulers of the darkness of this age, the rulers of this age, in John 12, 14, and 16, Satan is called the ruler of this world. This is all talking about this, and it all goes back to Babel. That's when this happened. So what's the fate of these territorial spirits, these lesser Elohim who are given rulership or influence over certain parts of the world? Now we come back to Psalm 82. God's taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgments. He, he's rebuking them, right? He's telling them, you're not doing your job. They're going to be stripped of their rulership. He says, I said you are God, sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall as one man, O princes. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to suffer the fate of mortal men. And of course, we see that in the book of Revelation, when they're ultimately cast into the lake of fire. But the last phrase of Psalm 82 is important. It says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit, what? <laughs> All the nations. See, even though God has disinherited the nations at Babel, he's given them over to these lesser Elohim, and he's allowed them temporary rulership or territoriality over different geographic regions. He says, my portion's Jacob. Okay, I'm going to do my work through one specific people group. He's going to start to prove his promises, right? And demonstrate his power over false gods. This is why God is constantly warning his people not to worship false gods. Gods. The word that is often used for those false gods is Elohim. Baal is called an Elohim. Ashtoreth is called an Elohim. Milcom is called an Elohim. Chemosh is called an Elohim. Don't think of these other gods as fairy tales or folklore. Clearly there was and is some kind of supernatural power behind these false gods of the world. Think about Pharaoh's magicians being able to produce some of the very same miracles as Moses, up to a point, right? We're told that the coming of the Antichrist is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So this is why we will read of Yahweh demonstrating his power over other gods. This gives context to the Exodus. This gives context to Elijah's victory at Mount Carmel. This gives context to the Ark of the Covenant toppling over the statue of Dagon. Those are all false gods. And God's demonstrating his superiority over all of them. But God's going to take back the nations. He says, my portion is Jacob. And he says to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And of course, we know the seed is Christ, Galatians 3.16. But when does this happen? Okay, Psalm 82.8 begins, arise, O God, and judge the earth. Now, scholarship is divided. But many people point out that the word arise at the beginning of this verse 
is the same word for resurrect. And it may suggest that the work of the Lord beginning to bring back the nations to himself happens in connection with the resurrection. And I think there's merit to that. I think this is why Jesus says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. Colossians 2 says on the cross, Jesus disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them. It's why Jesus says the gospel must be preached to all the nations. I think this is why you see Jesus descending into the heart of the earth to preach to the spirits who are in prison. He's declaring the victory to them. He's going to them and saying, Yahweh has accomplished his work. Yahweh has dealt the death blow to all of these lesser Elohim in reconciling the nations to himself. Now, what does this mean for us, right? What's the takeaway? I mean, this is all just kind of interesting stuff to talk about, but I would say this, for one thing, this should move the Great Commission to front and center of our Christian walk. Because we have been commanded to go and make disciples of who? All the nations, right? And so this is not just, I think sometimes the way we think about evangelism, we think, well, this is just a spiritual activity that God has suggested we get involved in uh, because we need something else to fill up our calendar, right? This is part of God's purpose in casting down all of the false gods in the world, in dethroning principalities and powers, and reconciling all the disinherited nations back to himself. Secondly, I would say it does seem there is going to be some sort of, we'll call it a great upending that's going to take place. These sons of God in the Old Testament who sat upon thrones with whom the Lord shares authority, who are given rulership over the nations, now you and I, through the cross, we have been born again. We are going to be sons of God. We are going to sit on thrones. The Lord is going to share authority with us specifically to reign over the nations. See, the language of what awaits us should evoke what we read about in the Old Testament. So I would say this, if nothing else, there is just so much more going on than our meeting Jesus and getting our life together and sort of having our moral compass reset and, you know, getting involved in a spiritual club where we begin to... Those things are all fine, but we have actually become involved in something that Yahweh has for millennia been doing to demonstrate his power, his sovereignty, not just over the nations of men, but every false God and lesser Elohim, the sons of God who rebelled and to whom he gave temporary geographical territoriality over through the church through the work of jesus christ on the cross god is reversing all of that and is going to usher in this entirely new order and you and i get to be a part of that it's exciting stuff so you guys have been very patient tonight i appreciate your attention if you have any questions by all means come up and let's chat afterwards Uh, I would also just say this now as we continue forward in our study of the book of Genesis and on into future books of the Bible, just start to take note of all of these things. Yahweh, the sons of God, the Most High, the heavenly host, the false gods, the nations. Once you start looking for it, it's all over the place. And it's really, really exciting stuff. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to assemble together tonight as your people, to sit at your feet and look at your word together. Just pray that you would, Lord, just quicken our hearts uh, for this great thing, this work that you're doing in reconciling the nations back to yourself. Thank you that you 
have proven yourself to be who you claim to be, to who, be who the Bible says that you are. You are the most high. There is none like you, the only living God. Thank you for the seed of Abraham, for Jesus. Thank you that our names are written in the book of life. And I pray that you would fill us all with a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. Empower us to go out equipped with your word and in your grace and share the good news of salvation with the world around us that daily we almost seem to see the influence of demons and these fallen angelic hosts, Lord. Just, we cannot wait until you come back and set this all right. We look forward to what you have in store for us. But Lord, until then, help us to be about your work and taking the gospel, the good news to all the nations around us. We love you. We pray these things together tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.